Hello, so here's a book I'd really like to take a peek at, Applied Dimensional Analysis and Modeling uh, by Thomas Zertes. Big old book, um, let's see, 800 pages or so. It's not that scary. It's not as scary as 800 pages might lead you to believe. Um, in this book, basically he's going through dimensional analysis and scaling stuff, and it's a very, very comprehensive book. Uh, fortunately, most of the book is just examples. So way right here in the back, it's just examples over and over and over. So we'll get to that. All right, so we'll notice that um, I put this in here in 2007. So I've had this well before I started teaching. I thought it was a good, useful book. Um, what did I put in here? What is this? This has nothing to do with this. This has got to do with dimensional analysis for electrostatic quantities, which is a very interesting topic. But this is basically a huge book on the mathematics of dimensional analysis. Um, it's a little different from the dimensional analysis you'd normally use with um, in a physics class. And usually we'll use length uh, mass, time, things like that. We'll use sort of a very, um, very abstract way of saying that because we don't care how you're going to measure the time when you're looking at physical stuff. It's always going to end up being um, dimensionally homogeneous. Here, however, this is an engineering text. So all of these are in um, meters, kilograms, and seconds. Zerdes is Canadian, so he doesn't have to deal with um, feet and pounds, or slugs, actually, but that's, that's all right. So let's come here and just look at this, and we'll talk about more things later on. Um, got mathemat mathematical preliminaries. Apparently, that's by someone else. Uh, this is just sort of the math that you're going to use in this book, uh, which are matrices um, and sets of linear equations. So basically you can end up with dimensional analysis setting up huge um, dimensional equations that you're trying to fix up together. And so you need the math to actually look at these you know, large numbers of equations that you have to use, that you have to simultaneously solve. And that math is linear algebra, if you don't remember. <clears throat> okay, formats and um, classification. Um, so these are just different ways you can write physical relations numerically, symbolically, mixed. Uh, you'll, you're probably familiar with these. Um, you know, you can say 3 meters plus x is equal to 7 meters or something like that. You can say a plus x is equal to b, and you can mix things up in different ways. Uh, then classification of physical quantities, um, talking about uh, the variability in their dimension, dimensionality. We really care about the dimensionality here. We care about are these how we're going to actually measure these things. Um, is this a time measurement? Is this a speed measurement? And so forth. Um, then he goes through dimensional systems. Now there are lots of dimensional systems. There are very scary ones like monodimensional systems. Now dimension does not mean three dimensions like length, width, and breadth, although strangely enough that can be used. We'll talk about that later. In general it means meters or it means length, time, um, mass, electrical current, and so on, things like that. And they're a minimal set for the kinds of measurements we do. Actually, the minimal, set is, the minimal set is actually one. You can get everything down to length, you know, measuring lengths if you want to. That leaves out a lot of the um, physical content, though, so you don't really um, see some of the things that are going on. And that's actually one of the problems I have with theoretical physics, because sometimes, you know, by setting everything equal to one, it's just 
of, you know, H is equal to one, G is equal to one, C is equal to one. Now everything is just a number, which is fine in some ways, um, not in others. Uh, then you can have systems with different numbers of dimensions in them. In a classification scheme, which I don't remember, on page 42. Oh, just force-based and mass-based. Okay, so um, normally, so force-based is an engineering system. So normally a pound is a measure of force, and so that's a force-based system versus a mass-based system. That's actually uh, kind of beside the point in general. Sometimes it's um, important, but usually it's beside the point. And then he talks about the SI units. Um, and, you know, different kinds of uh, things that go along with that. Oh, no, that, oh, good. I got scared. Okay. Um, the structure of the SI unit. Um, different kinds of things, you know, how even things to, down to the naming conventions. There are naming conventions, et, rules of etiquette in the writing system, a few problems in there, um, difference between derived units. And there are a few non-SI units that are still permitted to be used with SI. So a lot of these things are kind of technical and not meaningful, right? Let, I mean, let's look at my old system. I said I did a lot of things previously in magnetics. Almost nobody uses the SI system in magnetics unless they basically have to. Usually you're using Ersteds instead of Tesla. Um, or amps per meter. Um, probably Ersteds go with amps per meter. Gauss go with um, Tesla. And the weird thing about the Gaussian units is that one Ersted is equal to one Gauss to make everything really, really weird. But everything in electromagnetic units end up being weird. So that's something here. So We've gone through the SI units and then some other kinds of units, other metric units, the CGS system, which uh, what we use, what we now call the SI units, the MKS units, uh, replace MKS being mass, kilograms, seconds. The old units were centi centimeters, grams, seconds. Because they want to keep the numbers reasonably similar. Obviously, it should have been meters, grams, seconds, but for some reason, they can't bring themselves to do that because that makes the numbers large. So they want sort of small numbers in most common situations, common mechanical situations. So they're a little annoyed at that. Um, the American British force system, mass system, one's engineering, one's scientific, say la vie. Um, so that's not, uh, that's not something you usually have to worry about unless you're an engineer. Um, maybe they'll make you use that somewhere else. But CGS systems, they're, they're actually multiple CGS systems. Uh, if you get into elect electrical units and stuff like that, there's a Gaussian unit and a, um, an electrostatic unit. So they're actually multiple CGS systems. So that should have an S at the end. But say la vie, right? Transformation of dimensions. Uh, I think really that's not, I'm not sure if that's transformation of dimensions. Let's see, see that real quick. I'm going to guess that that is, yeah, that's just change of units, which is a slightly different thing. You're not, you're not changing dimensions, you're changing um, units. So that's the only weird, that's the only thing I don't like about Xerxes, Xerxes is that he's got a he's got a sort of hiccup between dimensions and units. Now, a lot of engineers do, especially my um, first year engineering students, they have a difficult time with that, but um, that's sort of normal. It's a little bit weird to sort of abstract the idea of all the different possible length units, right, saying, you know, there's something that's in common between a meter and a fathom 
and a parsec, right? They're all sort of kinds of the same thing. And as far as our equations are concerned, all we care about is they're kind of the same, that kind of thing that they are. That's the dimension, sort of a category of things. The arithmetic of dimensions, um, things you can add and subtract. Dimensional homogeneity, this is the most important thing here, right? Once you get to dimensional homogeneity, you're getting to something that you can start using, right? And the big idea about that is the dimensional equations have to be dimensionally homogeneous, right? Every single term in an equation has to be of the same dimension. So, uh, or every single additive term. It actually doesn't matter where it shows up. So if you have a x minus y in the denominator of something, they better be the same dimension. They have to match their dimensions. If you have a plus b equals c, a, b, and c all have to have the same dimensions. Actually, a plus b minus c equals d. Everything has to have the same dimensions. If it's a plus, minus, or an equal sign, the terms on either side of those things have to have the same dimension after you know, you've done all the work. So just as if you were going to add things together, they'd have to have the same units. So if you're actually going to do the physical, or if you're going to do the actual arithmetic um, uh, operation. So the structure, so this is the key, basically, to everything about uh, dimensional analysis. All this other stuff is going to only work with dimensional homogeneity. This is the most important thing. This is the very first day of physics class. This is the most important thing. And it becomes important. It stays important the rest of your time, right? This book written by Thomas Zertes, who, like many engineers, didn't know very much about, about didn't know very much about dimensional analysis until he came to a problem that required it. And after he started using it, he found it worked with lots and lots of things. Dimensional analysis books are often written by fluid dynamicists, people who work with a lot of fluids, um, engineers that work with a lot of fluids as well. Uh, and that's just because a lot of the things that are going on in fluids, you need to make your models you need to make models that work out and you need to be able to do a lot of this stuff a lot of this work that, with them although if you go through these these books you'll find out that lots of people james jeans has some you know fairly famous quote about you know dimensional analysis i believe it's james jeans um saying that's all you need and stuff like that or no that arthur eddington i think it was so uh very very important um, people in the history of science thought this was the deal. If you understood the dimensions of something, you understood 50% and 70%, 80% of what was going on. Okay, the structure of physical relations. First, you know, how you write physical relations. Um, the dimensional matrix, which is something you're not going to find in a lot of places. Even other books that I have on dimensional analysis don't really get into that. This is where you're going to start using, well, not here. It's actually going to come down here a little bit. But this is where all of this matrix stuff is going to come up. But once you have, uh, you know, your model, your dimensional model, this matrix comes in handy. Uh, generating products of the desired dimension, number of independent sets of, a, of products of a given dimension, and things like this, Bunk Buckingham's theorem, that's actually really important. Completeness of a set of products of variables um, and so on. So uh, this is just talking about different ways things show up. So the number of minimum independent products of variables of a given dimension, you know, some of these are like one page or less. And that's because some of these are, these sections are pretty simple, right? The number of dimensions equals the number of variables, bam. The number of dimensions exceeds the number of variables. What what happens there? Number of, and the whole the whole section is the number of dimensions equals or exceeds the numbers of a number of variables. Um, uh, this is kind of important. So a dimensional model is a model that just says, okay, I know what sort of inputs I have. I know what I want as the output. 
and it sort of matches the dimensions of those things. Now, if you don't have enough inputs, if you have uh, fewer than the minimum number of independent independent variables, then um, you're going to end up with a class of equations. Sometimes that's fine. You can just add them up in a power series, and, and that's fine. But um, But what you really want is something where you get a simple, a single dimensionless product. And that is, if you match up the number of a number of variables, things that are going into your into your model, with the um, number of dimensions possible. So if the number of dimensions in this equation equals the number of um, independent variables, then you get a single result. You, it, it would be like linear um, independence if we were talking about a set of equations in linear algebra. So that's the same sort of idea. I mean, in the end, that's what this is all going to come down to is a similar number of these things. So uh, this, a lot of this in this structure of physical relations is pretty common if you've gone through a linear algebra class and so on uh, as long as you get the first step right the first step is the hard step right is how to make that dimensional equation uh, maybe we'll look at that a little bit later uh, I'm not yeah, well he's got lots of examples the first step step is the easy part usually that's uh, creating the um, dimensional equation then you have a bunch of math now the thing is is that that when you're using dimensional analysis, if you're mod or actually dimensional modeling, you have to do the modeling, which means you have to have some sort of physical intuition about the system, about what sort of things go in and what sort of things come out. Right? That's what we're going to look for. Systematic, systematic determination of the complete set of products and variables. So this basically is telling you what's going to happen. This is how you do it. And I think this is the easiest sort of set, right? Dimensional set, derivation of products of variables, and so on. So this is basically doing what I was saying you want to do, is you go through, you guess the things that are going to vary in your system. Um, you set those equal to your thing. Um, and, and then you take the exponents and make them variables. So it would be like uh, length to the alpha. Uh, mass to the beta and so on um, is equal to uh, you know density to the gamma and, and that's equal to uh, that's not going to work and acceleration to the delta is equal to the velocity or something like that that's going that's not going to give a good result but that will give you the um, dimensional equation, which is going to be um, based on the dimensions of each one of those quantities and times the uh, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Let's see if this has a good... Look to it. Oh... There are some universal constants. Okay, so this is finding the dimensionless um, products. You'd really like to have a single dimensionless product, but that's not necessary. But you see here, what you're doing is you're starting. This is you know the power requirement of a rotating blade mixer. First thing you do is you guess what sort of things are happening. Well, first, you want the power requirement. That goes in your uh, model. How fast you're going to have the mixer, um, the ro have the blade rotate. That goes in there. The diameter of the blade, how wide is the blade, and the viscosity of the medium. So these are the guesses about the amount of power that go in. So power, that's what you want. Rotational speed, obviously, the more speed you have, the more power you're going to use. The blade diameter. So probably, my guess, would be it takes more power to spin a 
a, a wider blade, right? Um, and then the viscosity of the me medium, the more viscous the, the, the more viscous the medium, the harder it is to make the thing spin. So you're putting these guys together. And now this is your dimensional matrix, or this is your dimensional matrix. So this is P is equal to omega to the alpha, uh, D to the beta, mu to the gamma. And these are the alpha, beta, uh, these are not the alpha, beta, and gamma. These are the um, units for each one of these. So power is meters squared kilogram times kilograms divided by seconds cubed. Uh, omega, the um, rotational speed is hertz or one over seconds. D is, you know, the width of or the blade diameter, so that's just in meters. And then the viscosity is kilograms divided by meters divided by seconds, uh, right there. And now what you want to do is basically diagonalize this matrix. I believe that's what you want to do. Oh. And then you come out with um, this, con This you know, you go through all the math, which I don't want to teach you. It, you end up with power is equal to some constant. You can't get that constant from this analysis. Times omega squared times d times mu times something times this other uh, constant. Um, because this is overdetermined. We have too many. Um, parameters. Or is it underdetermined? Do we have too few parameters? For some reason I feel like we should only have one result. So, oh, this is a constant. Okay, so, I'm sorry. Then, um, so we don't have to actually have to worry about that. So we have omega squared times d times mu is our answer, basically. Um, and you do that just by looking at the dimensions. In this case, he uses units because, like I said, he's confused between dimensions and units, but it's not a big deal, right? Um, and that's basically what you're going to do in you know, checking results and the fundamental formula and stuff like that. Um, not that amazing. And we have transformations, so you want to go between different um, variables, different sets of variables, and you can do that. Uh, what happens to your matrices? Number of sets of dimensionless products of variables. So uh, depending on what you have, right, you get um, different numbers of sets. And so you don't want to... You, you can have different sets of variables, possibly. You know, you could end up with different things that are dependent on each other, right? If the velocity of, or if this, if that omega that we were just looking at was necessarily going to be dependent on uh, the viscosity, right? If omega is dependent on the viscosity itself, then you have some issues, and you want to look at some other um, different variables, possibly. Uh, you might want to look at this in terms of variables only that you can control. Maybe there's something in there you can't control, but there's something else is equivalent. Right? So you can go to different dimensional sets. Relevancy, um, sometimes you'll find that dimensions, um, you know, you have a variable that doesn't actually mean anything that you need to put in there. Um, and that is actually fairly interesting that you can actually end up with a solution by putting something else in the, there that doesn't really mean anything, um, especially physically. Economy of graphical presentation. Uh, one of the things that's useful here is if you can get dimensionalist relations, remember you had a tau 1 and a tau 2, if you get those two dimensionalist variables and you plot it, you can plot every system that has those three different um, input variables, or those four variables, because you have the power as well. So you choose those um, those two variables, and that gives you all of the information that somebody needs. You can put that in one graph. So you can condense all of the information into one graph. 
which is very useful for presentation. Let's say, you know, you could have in your paper, you could have one graph with 20 spaghetti curves, or you could have um, one graph with, or you could have 20 graphs with single curves, or you could have one graph with the dimensionless variables on either side and just have one curve. And then you just trust your audience to be able to say, okay, power divided by viscosity versus um, uh, the length or the diameter times the um, frequency, right? Or, or the rotational speed. And then you'll end up with a single curve rather than having multiple curves, something like that. Not necessarily that, but something like that. It would actually necessarily be different because there's a square on the um, angular speed. So you'd have to have d times omega squared. And you could get end up with uh, one graph that you know, basically did everything. In that particular one, I think you could you could actually get away with just um, power versus that particular product. Uh, forms of dimensionless relationships. Uh, I think this is approximately the place where things get really, really specific, and I didn't really do very much with it, so I can't tell you too much. Um, about uh, too much about it, but you know you can look at different forms of these things, and pretty pretty much you end up with different things going on with these matrices and different ways you have to work with them. A sequence of variables in the dimensionless set. This is when you end up having um, when you don't have enough variables, you end up with an, with a bunch of different things going on. Alternate dimensions. Am I not seeing, I'm not seeing dimension, reduction of the number of variables, fusion, fusion, fusing variables, increasing the number of dimensions. Oh, here's one. This is what I was thinking about. This is the really cool one. Dimension splitting, right? So, so far we've been saying, okay, if I have a ruler, right, I've got my ruler, and if whenever I measure something with this ruler, that's one kind of dimension. But it doesn't matter if I use the centimeter side. It doesn't matter if I use the inches side. I get one kind of dimension. Um, but when you start doing these uh, this dimension splitting, you can have two different weird things happen. One is you could say if I um, measure horizontally, that's different from measuring vertically. Right now this seems weird but it actually works this and that's a really weird thing is that measuring something um, horizontally and measuring something vertically splitting that up actually works although sometimes you don't have to do it um, and sometimes you know it would be wrong to do it usually it would be wrong to do it um, yeah, or it would add unnecessary complications in interpretation but in in certain cases, if you don't have enough variables, you can add more variables just by saying, okay, well, I'm just going to use x and y, the length in the x and the length in the y direction, um, a little bit differently. This is actually where this gets, this is where Zerdi's um, thing, where he starts, where he's using meters, seconds, and um, kilograms starts looking weird because uh, meters sub x versus meter sub y is a really weird thing, whereas length sub x just means length in the x direction. That's fine. Meters in the x direction versus meters in the y direction, well, they're just meters, right? So that's getting a little bit weird, whereas you, you can, it's easy to say length in the y direction and length in the x direction are both measured the same way, but there's something a little bit different about them in my, um, in my equation, right? I have to make sure that the acceleration and the velocity you know, I care about the acceleration and the velocity in the y direction, let's say, whereas the other, where I was, whereas I might care about other things in the x direction, right, for the range and the um, initial velocity. So the initial uh, x component of the speed of the velocity. So you can split things up that way and you get numbers. What's really weird, okay, this doesn't say it exactly, 
what's really weird is if you really understand what's going on, you can split up like inertial mass versus gravitational mass. Now that does mean that in each quantity you have to know the difference between what's inertial mass and what's gravitational mass. And there's another um, inertial mass versus gravitational charge, let's say. And there's one more thing, which is just um, mass as an inherent measure of the quantity, like when you're talking about moles, or not moles, um, molar mass, for example. Mass has nothing, in that case has nothing to do with inertia. It has nothing to do with gravity. It only has to do with how much stuff you have. Right? So I guess density would have been perfectly fine with that as well. So you have these three different, three different concepts of what mass means, and you can actually split those up. Right? Split those up in your dimensional equation. Split those up in your model to be doing different things. And, you know, all of the math still works. All, all of this stuff still works. It's like you had an extra dimension out of nowhere, which is incredibly strange. But it's also very awesome. So this is like one of the coolest things about this book that you almost never see any, anywhere else. It's, it's, just a, it's just an amazing thing. So I learned from this book and, and probably the biggest reason why I like this book uh, is that, is that um, chapter. Dimensional modeling. Um, now you're going to end up with a lot of similarity and scaling things and stuff like that. Uh, this is a big use of dimensional analysis is modeling, right? Um, I don't know. Have you ever read the book by Ellie Modestit, The Magic Engineer? Uh, it's a it's a it's a good book. Uh, the magic system's weird. I mean, it's a fantasy book in a fantasy world, and the magic system is kind of wonky. And you know, there are things about it, but it is a book about an engineer. But I mean, you have this magician guy, exiled magician guy who invents scaling, right? And you know, some of the things are well, if I scale something down, if I scale a ship down. I don't want to use this. Do I have any balsa wood? I don't have any balsa wood. This is my office, not my um, workshop. So, um, you know, you uh, you don't want to use, if you're making like a little scale ship, you don't want to use steel on that ship because it doesn't have the right properties as you scale it down. And dimensional analysis can help you tell you, can help tell you how uh, you have to change the density of the material as you scale things down, or it depends on what you want, um, the strength of the material and things like that. So when you make a scale model of something, a physical scale model, you have to use a different material to check whether or not it's a, it's actually, say, a stable thing, whether or not it's going to fall apart for some reason, because, you know, as you reduce, you know, as you change things, you, you know, the balsa wood is a, for, you know, a six inch, um, for a six, six inch model of an airplane, the balsa wood's a better sort of model of steel than steel is, right? Steel, steel for your um, 747, let's say. So These dimensional equations, very important, or this scaling stuff, really important, very important to understand. And then chapter 18 is 52 problems. You can see here, um, basically over 100 pages of problems there, and appendices and stuff like that. So really, you only have 525 pages, and a lot of it's useless, right? I mean... I think I did read the dimensional systems, but that was just an awful time. Uh, it was an awful 30 pages. Um, you don't really need to know these things. Um, I only read it because I was sort of preparing to start teaching classes and stuff like that. So, um, it's really only here, arithmetic in, of dimensions and stuff like that, that really gets interesting. So, 
and start to get these ideas about exactly how to put these things together. So lots of problems in here for you to actually work. And then lots of examples, a whole lot of examples. So you can see this chapter 18 is just example after example after example. Most of them are sort of physical, the pitch of a kettle drum. So that, that's actually interesting there. Um, or here's here's a um, more economic one. I mean, actually, this is something that's important for engineers is to figure out sort of um, economy things. The cost of uh, putting a unit of goods over a unit of distance, right? Transportation cost. Engineers are. It's important for engineers to know things like that. So, example eight point three seven, eighteen point three seven is operational characteristics of the aircraft. So. Uh, very, very interesting things. Um, you'll notice that he has a very particular way of doing things, right? Which is good. This, which is good. That's one of the things that is. I don't think it was really in vogue when I was in school, but since I um, started teaching and stuff like that, it's become really, really emphasized. Is do everything in a nice coherent step-by-step um, -step manner. More so in engineering than in physics, but still in physics. So the only place I really had to do these sorts of things was in my quantum mechanics class where the professor required us to use a particular format for the answers, which is fine because I already rewrote things. And at some point I picked up the math habit of writing, you know, You'd have a theory, you have a state problem statement, and then I'd give the proof, right? What well, you know, problem statement, proof, and blah. Uh, I'd already so I'd already picked up that habit because I had a physics math double major, and one of the things I've done in the one of the things I did um, for my physics class is I went, you know, given I just wrote down what I needed and um, what. And then I wrote the answer. Uh, that's basically how I started out doing things. And it got uh, more and more complicated as I went on in school. And not because the professor said so, because I just found it very important when I was rewriting problems, right? when I was rewriting my um, problems in school, to go through and rewrite them in a nice organized manner. And that, made, that let me find a whole lot of problems uh, with different things. Oh, that looks beautiful. Is that a problem? Optimal density and location pattern for retail shops. You know, this is just weird in, in a book that's mostly engineering stuff. But, you know, you know, this is just awesome. This is just an awesome, weird problem that you solve with dimensional analysis. Other weird things you can uh, solve with dimensional analysis are things like um, there's a proof for the Pythagorean theorem. Although it doesn't work quite right. right? So it ends up being um, c squared equals constant times a squared plus b squared. But, you know, hey, that's the way things work. Or maybe it's c squared equals a constant times a squared plus a constant times b squared. But that works perfectly fine. That's perfectly um, okay. That's what dimensional analysis does then you find the constant. And if you measure area in some way other than, say, square meters, right, that's important. You are going to have to get that constant, right? If you measure your area in um, yards, let's say, and or your, you measure your area in acres, and then you um, measure your distance in yards, then Right, you're going to end up with a different constant. You're going to have a constant out there that's the um, transformation between those two things. So usually we don't bother with that, but that I mean that's just sort of the way it is, uh, especially if you're interpreting things like uh, Zerdes does. So like I said, other than that very strange thing that he does, well, let's let's not end. Let's go look at chapter 16 because I said it was so beautiful. Um,
right, so let's see, we were looking for where he, so here we have um, nothing, right, does he? Now here's my increasing the number of dimensions. So let's see. So I think here he does this. He attempts to do this, and it doesn't work out, right? So he ends up with this function of a bunch of crap, right? That's that's no good. You end up with like a power series, but. What he's done is he said, okay, well, I look at all these things, right? I've got my um, height of the meniscus here. That's in the Z direction. So I've got a density of the liquid, right? That's got two in the transverse direction and one in the Z direction. I've got m the inner radius of the tube. That's in the um, transverse direction. I've got the gravitational acceleration that's going down. So that's Z and the surface tension in the liquid, which is pointing out of the liquid which is again in the z direction. Once I do that, right, he can come over here and just get a nice simple answer, right? He gets a single solitary answer rather than this thing here, which is a power series. Um, so, and there's an R here, so that's it's a little bit different. So again, you've changed the nature of the problem by saying that, by giving the length, by measuring by saying that length measured in different directions according to the problem has a different um, meaning. Um, dimensional analysis of the conical pendulum gives him the right answer. I just want to see, does he do the... No. I do the thing. Well, this has lots of masses. So what he's going to do is fail to get the uh, mass of the fluid flowing through a tube, and then he's going to come over and say, well, rather than just having kilograms, I'm going to have inertial kilograms and quantity kilograms. Then all of a sudden the world works for no, for no apparent reason other than he just changed that, right? So now I've got he's got two different kinds of kilograms, one that has to do with the inertial properties of the fluid, the fluid moving through the pipe, and another dealing with the amount of the stuff moving through the pipe. And the different things here, right? Pressure has to do with uh, the force, which has to do with inertia. Density has to do with the quantity, which, or yeah, has to do with the um, quantity, the mass, so it has to do with the quantity. The um, viscosity, again, that's kinetic, so that has to do with the inertial mass. And so we get different um, things here. And the Q, which is, um, the mass of the fluid through the pipe, again, that we're giving our mass flow rate, basically, that is going to give us the um, quantity again. So uh, that's basically how it does it. So only the density is directly related to the quantity we want to find, right? Where, whereas the viscosity and the um, pressure difference ha have to do with something else and so their relationship is secondary and then you get your um, your answer so again Xerxes very good except for the weird thing with the units instead of dimensions um, very nice for learning dimensional analysis very good for practical things very good for getting a first impression of a problem right so when you first look at a problem you might just want to get an idea of what the answer should look like. You can use dimensional analysis a lot of times if you understand the physics. You can use dimensional analysis to get a really quick understanding of what the answer is going to look like. You know, to within a constant, or maybe it's it's going to have to be one of these um, options or something like that, just by using dimensional analysis by doing dimensional modeling. Okay, so. Very good book. I really do recommend it if you're going to do anything practical with your life. Um, if you're not, then 
can probably get a you can probably get along with the stuff from your first semester of physics. It's supposed to be in that um, first. Uh, it's in that first chapter of your physics book. It's probably not um, emphasized by a lot of people because it's you know dimensional analysis needs a little bit of work to get used to before everything goes bad. All right, or be before everything um, works out, before you figure out what's going on. Otherwise, everything goes bad. So you need to spend a little time with it. And people are just trying to get out of that first chapter of their first physics text as soon as possible so they can get to forces as soon as possible. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye now.